Hello everyone, I'm High Treason and Penelope. That's kind of uh, a bit of an inconvenience. I can't get through here. Hey, what's this? Hmm, Nightmare 3D. Well, I guess seeing as I'm stuck here, we could take a look at it while we wait for Penelope to come back. So, Nightmare 3D was released in 1994, and if you hadn't guessed, it's pretty straightforward a plot. You play as Hugo, and you go into a spooky house to get your loved one Penelope back. I don't really know how that stands, whether she's his fiance or he just likes her, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I don't suppose it really matters. Anyway, let's look at things a bit more in depth, that's not really telling us a whole lot, is it? To run this game you're going to need a 386 as a minimum and by today's standards it's going to slow down at the bottom of the system requirements like that. It's probably better to just use a 486 or something faster. At first glance it's very easy to write this whole game off as yet another crappy Wolfenstein 3D clone and I made this mistake. The engine is similar though it renders things slightly differently, the controls are much the same and initially the levels appear to work the same way. Only instead of Nazis, it's like you've walked into the set of a cheap horror movie. No matter how easy it is to dismiss the game at this early stage, done. This is where the similarities end, and that cheesy horror movie vibe is actually one of this game's most genius aspects. I'll tell you why later, so bear with me, but firstly, let's go over a little bit of history. Nightmare 3D is not the first game in its series, in fact it's the fourth, and the original games date back to 1990 with Hugo's House of Horrors. There is a definite Sierra influence about this, as well as the next two Hugo games, Who Done It and Jungle of Doom respectively, released in 1991 and 1992. Nightmare 3D probably has more in common with these adventure games than it does with Wolfenstein 3D. Often it feels as though the FPS element is secondary to the puzzle solving aspects of the game and going in with the assumption that you're going to be mindlessly running around shooting horror movie cliches won't get you very far. In the first level alone, well, you might get by as you only need to find a key and ID card in an area right by the exit. Things change quite quickly though and this is where many players who went in with an FPS centric mindset seem to drop out. As was common for first-person games of the time, the maze game aspect is still quite strong. If you stick with the game, you'll quickly find yourself dealing with hidden panels, pushable object puzzles, classic fetch quests, and maps which are intimidatingly large and complex. By the time you reach the fourth stage, there's very little semblance of Wolf 3D clone left to argue for. This game plays much differently, it looks different, and it sounds different really the short version is they're very different games. Music and sound options go as far as the PC speaker or Sound Blaster audio with Adlib FM Music under MS-DOS. The detection for this seems reliable most of the time, which is more than can be said for some more high-profile games. It does work. Similarly, the video renderer appears to be quite reliable, and most any VGA card, except maybe the very oldest models from the 80s, should display it properly. You can use a mouse or a game controller like a joystick in place of the keyboard or alongside it, but I've never done this and can't really vouch for how well it might work for you. I guess that's somewhat subjective. The game certainly does detect them as it should. I just feel like the keyboard is a preferable interface for controlling a game like this myself. With the keyboard, those controls really are quite typical of their time. It's not like there's much to learn about them. Hugo moves around a little stiffly with no real inertia and minor rounding errors when turning or walking at off-grid angles, like many other games in the era. And this was common because precise mathematics used more CPU power and it was just needless. You can get by with this. You're not really going to notice that much. 
And by the standards of what came later, there's definitely room for improvement, but it's serviceable and it gets the job done. It is worth noting that aside from the regular walk speed, you have run and sneak speeds too. Unconventionally, the left shift slows you down and the right shift speeds you up. Many people seem to forget that using the slow key will make you turn much more slowly and precisely, which is useful for aiming at distant objects that you can't reach. This is required in several levels. Otherwise, the Alt key makes you strafe and space interacts with objects. Control will fire your weapon, much like other games of the era, and of course you select weapon using the number keys. There is no jump or crouch key. Games like this don't really have those, and there's just no need for them. But I mean, let's be honest, the levels are flat. What are you going to jump over or crouch under? It's really just a typical product of its time in this regard. And, in all honesty, the same can be said for a good number of things in this game, that they were typical of their time. The flat levels, untextured floors, the episodic plot, the first of which was released as shareware, the use of gradients on pretty much every texture just to prove the game was using VGA modes. Obviously, in these regards, the game does nothing new and nothing special. But there's one thing to consider. The development team were small. Just three or four people likely working from home, or at best a very small office. Not a dedicated game studio. And sometimes you have to understand your limitations, rather than doing something new and doing it badly, it's often better to do something tried and tested and just do it well. I feel that's what they were doing here. However, the game does change things up a little. Dr. Hammerstein's house may appear to be wheelchair friendly, and in reality it is, the height of the levels does not vary at all. But they don't feel quite as flat as many other games, and the solution is so simple that it's truly ingenious. Some doors slide, other doors will essentially teleport you to the other side. Stairways, dumbwaiters and elevators really act much like the latter, only with a menu to select the direction you want to go. The height of the level doesn't change, but by laying it out cleverly with the use of these features, it does at least feel a little bit more three-dimensional than it might have done otherwise. It gives the illusion of floors being on top of one another rather than walking around in the old folks' home. Now going back to those hidden push walls and blast ball walls, it's very easy to become frustrated when looking for them, but you do have an auto map in the lower right corner of the heads up display. It will deplete magic eyes and crystal balls, which you have to collect, and I rather like this mechanic that the map is a finite resource. So be sure to toggle the map back off with the function keys when you're finished with it, otherwise it'll run out of power and you won't be able to use it again until you find more of the required items. The eyes show the layout, and the balls show the enemies and some other objects in the map. They can be activated or deactivated independently of one another. Without the map, the centre of the eye icon will always light up white when you're facing a hidden push wall within one grid square. These grid squares are predictably quite large, and your position in the map is measured by these in the lower centre of the heads-up display. You can actually get the exit location with the status screen which appears when you press tab, but, well, there's going to be walls and key doors in the way. It's not actually very useful, you're just going to find it anywhere. But sometimes the placement of objects in the map can give you a hint that there may be something there. A random out of place eye may well be a clue to check your map and push the wall there. Some of these hidden walls are required to complete the levels, and, well, these features of the heads-up display are quite easy to forget. I've seen even experienced players, including myself, just completely neglect to use them and then start getting frustrated. Which really didn't need to happen if we'd just used the features that the game had to offer. The whole one grid square thing I, I feel is worth elaborating on a little bit, because if you're not used to games that work this way, it might irritate you a little bit at first. Everything is one grid square, uh, essentially. So that means things like plants and gravestones are solid and take up an entire square, and you can't walk through them even though it looks like you would be able to in, say, a later, more complex game engine. It's not really a bad thing when you get used to it, but I can see why somebody who wasn't used to it might find it frustrating initially. But once your brain gets used to thinking of it as a wall, it's not really that much of an issue anymore. It's probably also worth noting that the way the game calculates things like whether enemies can actually hit you seems to also run along the grid squares rather than a trajectory in a straight line. And so occasionally they do shoot you round corners, 
Uh, I made some diagrams up to explain that when I was playing through the game on my second channel, but I don't know if they really make sense to anybody. Uh, it's a little bit hit and miss. As, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's just a side effect of things having to be simplistic. They could probably have worked around it and calculated things on a, on a straight line, but that would have been more intense on the processor. And Well, optimization was kind of the word of the day back then. You had to optimize things to get it to run well on even low-end systems, and because of that, they're making sacrifices like this, I'm sure we all know. Not everybody is Lucas Arts Entertainment, you know, not everybody can write a Jedi engine and somehow make something that's almost build engine to you run well on a 386 and full screen and yeah I think we can allow some leeway just again as this was pretty much written by one guy and it does work quite well for the most part. If that's the last problem we've got I don't really think there's much to worry about to be honest. Visually the game doesn't actually look too bad, compared with the bigger titles of the time there's no surprise that it is a bit lacking but again it's perfectly functional. There are actually two versions of the graphics, at least as far as enemy sprites go, the older version with traditional sprites and the newer version with pre-rendered models. Whichever you prefer is personal preference I suppose, games were still using both methods at the time this one was made, so it's a glimpse into a transitional period I guess. Of course it has a horror theme, but this game isn't even remotely scary. We've got all your favourite kids' Halloween pals, like Frankenstein monsters, mummies, witches, banshees, vampires, and robots, the aliens, and ghosts. Well, damn, this game has everything. Seriously, the enemy variety in this game is pretty impressive. They're all going to attack you in pretty much the same way, aside from what the sprite looks like, but their pattern for doing it is different, and the mechanics for different enemies varies. Some will even flee rather than get up in your face, and the weapon you select to take them on matters. Some weapons have no effect at all on some enemies whatsoever. The enemies in this game do look so delightfully tacky, and whilst I'm sure you're laughing at them and that cheesy B-movie music, believe it or not, this truly is one of the game's strongest points. Think about it, was this game ever going to scare you? Well, hell no, games aren't scary anyway. How many of them have tried and failed to scare us over the years? And man, how lame is it when that happens? Extremely lame, that's how. What about Nightmare 3D? You're sure as shit not going to get their frights out of something like this in the first place. What were, you, what were you hoping for? It was never the creator's intention, it wasn't even close. Dave Gray himself, the game's designer and programmer, stated that rather than aim for serious horror and come off laughably bad, he'd just aim for kind of laughably bad and cheesy, giving the player something more akin to a 1950s B-movie, and well, it sure as hell did that. These designs are just true classics. The artwork, the sound effects and the environment actually pull this off really well, it's, it's brilliant. Again, Nightmare 3D doesn't try to be something that it's not, something that it never could be. Instead, play into what it knows it can do well and deliver on it pretty much flawlessly in this regard. I am genuinely impressed. I'd like to see this done more. Now on the whole B-movie thing, the only other game which really comes to mind is House of the Dead. And as much as I do like House of the Dead, it's an on-rail shooter and, well... Yeah, I'm not as much a fan of those. In fact, House of the Dead is about the only one of those that I ever enjoyed. It's a shame this wasn't done more, as I said. I, I honestly think it's a complete waste when a lot of games just go to try and scare you with serious horror, because rarely does it work. There are very few fatal frames out there, you know. Most of them just fall flat and it ends up being really, really disappointing. Whereas, if it was trying to be goofy in the first place, well... Yeah, there's not really so much to be disappointed with. It was trying to be silly from the start. Naturally, the sound effects themselves are grainy and rather limited. There's not a lot of variety there, but the music is pretty damn good. Like the rest of the game, it fully embraces the low-budget horror film vibe without being ashamed of it.
There are a few missed opportunities for nods to Phantom of the Opera and such in that. still works rather well, it's quite an enjoyable experience, the music to be honest. To take on monsters you have four weapons, a plasma gun, a rather naff looking wand, silver bullets and a rapid fire plasma gun. As noted, these work differently on different enemies. The Doctor's clones really don't care how much you pull out your wand and wave it in their face, and the ghosts really couldn't care less if you fire silver bullets through them. Of course, they all have their own ammunition types, so you need to keep an eye on that too. As things wear on, the game will become more difficult. The large levels and hidden secrets can easily overwhelm you the first time through. Admittedly, some of the best gimmicks are reserved for the first episode, which is rather predictable. The second episode of the game is by far the hardest, and it's also the weakest point. Some of the levels there feel unfair, even due to overuse of enemies or questionable design choices, but the game does make up for this towards the end of the episode, and in the third episode, definitely. It's worth pushing through those few weaker levels in the middle of episode 2. I think episode 2 level 4 is the only time I had what I could call a truly negative experience with this game. At worst, otherwise, there were just times in which the game was frustrating. I do think it's worth remembering at this stage that all 30 of the levels were designed by just one guy, and in all fairness to him, you can't be expected to get it right every time. Some of them just aren't going to be as good, and I think we're quite lucky that those seem to all be grouped together and we can just move on and forget about them quite quickly. You do get to fight the Doctor at the end of the game, but like most 90s games, is kind of a laughable boss really, he's not much of a threat. Surprisingly, beating the game does give you an Autodesk animator <laughs> cutscene with Penelope, but it's short and it's simple. The game has some unused music too, one of which does appear to fit with the ending, but I guess we'll never know. It's a shame they didn't use it, as it's quite a nice waltz, and would have been even better if they'd had some extra channels in it like this. All in all, Nightmare 3D isn't perfect, but it does know its limitations, and it works well within their confines. I suppose we should put a score together for it so we can get an idea of where it sits on the scale. Graphics 15 out of 20. By 1994 standards, they're going to be limited by the game's engine somewhat, but it wins back points purely for the variety. There is a lot of variety. Level textures vary between the rooms of a large house, hedge mazes, dungeons, futuristic laboratories and castles, among other things. And a selection of these can be within the same level to differentiate areas within that level, which actually helps you to navigate things and figure out puzzles and hidden push walls. So regardless of the limitations, what is there does look good within the limits that they had to work with. The enemy sprites are just so amazingly classic horror, and given the setting of the game, they're really not a disappointment. Even though they are a little silly at times, I'd actually consider that silliness a big positive for them. There is an aspect of this game that I really, truly enjoy. Sound, 15 out of 20. Whilst the sound effects are quite limited, they are at least stereo, and they work well enough. 
it sounds more like a cheap cartoon or a B-movie than it does a serious fast-passing shooter or something, but again, that's really what they were going for, so that's a plus rather than a negative. Most of the points are awarded for the music because it's really good fun, it's enjoyable, even though some of the shorter tracks can become a little repetitive when you're stuck in a level for a while. All of it is delightfully cheesy, it's catchy, and it's fun. There are 15 songs in the game, but a few of them are never used. Nonetheless, you don't really run into the repetition of the same song within any given episode of the game. Every level within an episode will have its own music, though obviously as there are 30 levels and only around 13 songs that ever play, they will repeat across episodes somewhat. There is at least one unique song per episode, though, I think, so... Well, that's something to keep in mind. Atmosphere, 16 out of 20. Now I know what you're thinking, come on, the game isn't scary, what the hell are you even talking about giving it that kind of score? Well, it's not supposed to be scary, it's supposed to be spooky. And like a cheap horror film, you'd sooner laugh at it than hide behind the sofa. We know movies like that are kind of bad, but they're fun to watch, and you remember them. This feeling never really goes away throughout the game, even when you end up on a hard level. Given what we know, that the game was never meant to be scary, it never even tried to be in the first place, this actually means it achieved what it set out to do in this regard. It works! I'd actually like to see this kind of thing done again, a, a really naff low-budget horror setting instead of a game trying to go for seriously scaring you, it rarely works, whereas this actually works. I really like the thought of this. And let's be honest, most supposedly scary games are just completely lame, so... I don't know, I really do just feel like the whole silly aspect of this is one of its strongest points by far, which is kind of strange, really. Story and design, 14 out of 20. Well, we're not going to win much for the story, it's not going to lose much either, it doesn't break any new ground in that regard, your female friend gets kidnapped, you want to get her back, well, I take on the enemies and puzzles, yeah, it's, we've heard it before, and I guess it's not too important, really. The design, on the other hand, is fairly solid. Unfortunately, there are some places, often with pushable objects, where you can end up in an unwinnable state trapped in a corner somewhere, at which point it's impossible to complete that level unless you reload from a save which was made before moving those objects. You did do that right, because that is a feature in this game. Aside from that everything does seem to behave itself, some of the puzzles are quite clever and it does keep throwing new ones at you until the end of the game. Levels will become large and complex quite quickly, and this is helped especially by those fake stairways and elevators. You really do have to think it out in your head, because it doesn't feel so much like just a flat grid with everything in it now. You really do need to remember features like the map and the eye indicator in the heads-up display. They, they are useful, I can't stress that enough. Worth noting is that some older versions of the full game did have memory management issues, and they could crash on occasion. Usually this would manifest ahead of time as music not playing when you enter the level. This will go away if you restart the game, but it doesn't happen in later builds. It seems David Gray actually fixed the problem quite quickly, which, well, is more than can be said for many developers today. And a lot of those developers today are dedicated game development studios. You know, I think that says something. Mad props to Dave Gray. He found a problem and he fixed it. Maybe my expectations of when I pay for a game it should work aren't that unreasonable after all. Controls and gameplay, 14 out of 20. The controls are about as clunky as any other game on an engine like this, but they're not hard to get used to and when you use them properly, they're effective. I guess by now it's safe to say the game plays quite well, with the aspects we already noted. The cartoon graphics, the funny monsters, taxing puzzles and varied environments, it all comes together quite well. Though, again, it's not a shame to go full-on maze game or full-on puzzle games at time, and you will find yourself being frustrated with it, well, a decent amount of the time, especially if that's not your cup of tea. Always remember, the FPS element 
is nigh on secondary to all of this. In fact, killing monsters isn't always the right thing to do, and sometimes it's completely the wrong thing to do, and you have to keep them alive to use in part of a puzzle. Some of the hidden panels can take you a good while to find. You probably will discover that some levels take you several tens of minutes to complete the first time through. The middle of episode 2 is certainly the weakest part of the game. It has unfair enemy placement, and texturing that doesn't differentiate one area of a map from another, which most of the levels in the game have, and it does feature some pointless areas where you're just going to get shot up for no good reason. You'll get nothing out of it, and probably not enough health or ammo to replenish you from taking the enemies on there. It helps to know these levels in advance, and you're just going to have to make effective use of the safe features in these levels and get through them. Things do start to pick up again towards the end of the episode, leaving you to enjoy the third and final episode where everything returns to its usual quality. In fact, in many ways, episode 3 may be the, the best one for me. Overall, I do think we can allow some leniency given the small size of the development team, and they definitely put the effort in, and you really can't expect them to get it right every time. The fact that they got it right the majority of the time is good enough for me. So our total score for Nightmare 3D is 74 of 100. It's not the best game ever, but no matter what imperfections it has, it manages to be good old fashioned MS-DOS fun, and it achieves what it's set out to do. You can find the shareware version quite easily if you want to give it a try. The full version is still for sale on Dave Gray's website if you find that you like it enough to want to pay for it. Whilst the basic mechanics don't change hugely beyond the first episode, the game does still manage to throw some new things and different puzzles at you until the very end, and some of the puzzles will take you a good while and several tries to get right. Thank heavens for that save feature because you really are going to need it. I know this isn't everybody's cup of tea. If you just want a fast person shooter then, well, you probably are best off skipping this one. It, it's not going to work for you because it doesn't focus on that aspect too heavily and you're just going to wind up getting bored and getting stuck in the second or third level, but well, you can still try it, I guess. The shower's free, so by all means, give it a go. Overall, I do think the game is a goofy little adventure, which is worth experiencing at least once, if only in shower form. But I think we've covered about all there is to, to go over for now. I'll pass you back to that rather irritating fellow in front of the camera. And so there we go. I guess that settles that. As I said, I enjoy this game. It's not perfect, and it doesn't really break any new ground. And, as I have said a few times, I think that's actually a good thing, that rather than trying to do something new and doing it badly, it just did things that were already established and did them quite well. It does still manage to put its own spin on it. The puzzles can be really challenging, and it does keep throwing new card balls right up until the end of the game, so it's quite impressive, really, just how much they managed to get out of this. As I said, all the levels pretty much made by one guy and there's 30 of them in the game. It's not a small feat to put something like that together and still have a decent outcome most of the time. You know, it's, all in all, I think they did as, as good a job as they probably could be expected to and then some. But I think that's all I've really got to say about it and I'm kind of getting mad. Where the hell is this Penelope? She was supposed to be helping me do this and you know what, screw this. <laughs> you again? <laughs> Stop right there! <laughs> you know, you look like the sort who would play a Nintendo, and it's pretty typical of somebody like you to, in all of that rambling, completely forget to mention one of the most important aspects of this game, and that actually was quite innovative, because it runs natively on Microsoft Windows, with acceleration. That's right, Nightmare 3D actually has a native Windows port, which uses the WinG API. The WinG API, I guess, could in many ways be considered a precursor to DirectX, and we all know how successful that was, don't we, ladies and gentlemen? Mm, it's pretty much an industry standard today. Well, that's right, this game will run on Microsoft Windows using the WinG API. 
It's accelerated, runs very smoothly. We'll use whatever sound card the system has installed, whatever MIDI device you have selected. That's actually pretty cool, all things considered. I don't see Doom doing that. Doom's for dorks. And besides, this is the alleyest game I can think of that does this. I can't really think of any earlier examples, although they may exist. And even if they do, you got to admit, that really is pretty innovative. Anyway, that guy's a total dork, so I'm not even letting him do the outro. So remember, I'm Mullet Man, and I'm the best! Well, as it turns out, you forgot to mention some very important points, you floppy-eared prick. Not least of which is actually getting that Windows version to run. If you get the game from David Gray now, he includes a WinG DLL file, which I think is probably from Windows 95, and it's just there for, like, Windows XP, where it's not included in the OS or something. If you're trying to run it on Windows 3.1, you're probably going to want to delete that, or the game's just not going to start. Some things to bear in mind. Also, if you're playing the game and find yourself low on health or ammunition, then it probably is your fault, aside from some rare instances. It's a maze game quite a lot of the time, let's be honest. I mean, primarily puzzle and shooting stuff, but it, it does still have a lot of maze game aspects. It's very heavy here, and you probably should be exploring the maze properly. In almost every instance, aside from, as I say, some very rare circumstances, the exact thing you need will be very close by. It's as if they actually did play through this and test it, or at least understood what they were designing and thought about it. If you've been somewhere with a lot of enemies, there's almost always a hidden room close by that has ammunition and health in it. It's helped, especially if you can find these chests which have pentagrams in them of good sight and good health and power and knowledge. Those replenish health and ammunition on the map to 100% immediately, so... Like I say, if you're low on resources and low on health, have a look around, and it's almost always there. It's, it's never really that far away most of the time. Lastly, have you ever seen that movie Body Rock? Yeah, that has that same kind of cheese as this. I don't know. It, it, something about this game just makes me think of that bit with the, the Degla skeletons dancing around. It even says I'm tough in the difficulty selection, you almost wonder if it's deliberate. If you have seen that movie, I'm really sorry. And I, I'm afraid that's where I'm ending it as well, I'm leaving it on a downer. I'm out of here to leave you to uh, suffer with the trauma of having now probably gone and looked that film up, been like, what is this? Check the description, there might be some interesting music in there. Uh, but yeah, I'm I treason, thanks for watching. And remember, there'll be a screw up, load DOS 622 up and play this damn game on it.